Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Great Guild Wars 2 Countdown. 31 or wait, 31 or 30 yeah, 31 or 28 days remaining until the launch of Guild Wars 2. I have to be really quiet today because I've left it till literally the middle of the night before filming. I've wasted the entire day playing League of Legends, so yay for that. Uh, hopefully I won't get too loud as I go on, which I usually do while recording. But anyway, the footage in the background for today comes from the Alliance 04. So thank you very much to them, and you can find a link in the description below for more more of their stuff. They do more than just Guild Wars 2. They've got some TF2 stuff here and all sorts as well in addition. So thanks very much for that. The topic for today is, I'm actually going to skip ahead one just because I've seen this on my list and, and I really like it, is the Dominion of Winds and the Tengu Ball. So this is a personal favourite more than something other people had said, but uh, as you may or may not know, I'm quite into the Tengu and you may have seen in the most recent beta weekend event, particularly if you played a Silvari or spent a lot of time in the Caledon Forest area, there was a huge wall there, an absolutely massive wall, circling this huge section of Krita. It was a place we could go to in Guild Wars 1, but now in Guild Wars 2 is actually walled off to us. In fact, if you look at one of those maps of the in-game world with all of the explorable areas and places we can actually get to versus what's actually painted there on the world map, you can see there's like this huge chunk near Lion's Arch and all in basically in the middle of Krita that's just not available to us. And if you actually go in-game near there, you can find in Lion's Arch, you can find in the southern reaches of Kessex Hills, and you can find all the way up the side of the Caledon Forest, this massive, massive wall. And usually around the wall, you can find loads of Tengu. And that's because behind the wall is where the Tengu as a race have pretty much gone and hold themselves off in. Uh, in Guild Wars 1, they were a race that were all over the place. They were these really cool avian creatures that most of the time were fighting us. But when factions came out, we found some that were allied to us and we could talk to them. And we found out they were quite intelligent and had all these different things to say and do. Uh, but come Guild Wars 2, they've kind of been pushed away and they're still assessing the other races, I suppose. They're still deciding whether they want to join this fight against the Elder Dragons. Very much believe that they're going to be an expansion race, so that's very cool, but man, just this wall, the Dominion of Winds, what the Tengu built to keep themselves out looks incredible, and if you haven't seen any footage of it, or haven't seen it for yourself, it will blow your mind. It kind of reminds me of back with Guild Wars 1. That game actually was really good graphically when it first came out. There weren't many MMOs that looked that good, and I remember one of the moments in Guild Wars 1 for me that really kind of blew my mind and thought, whoa, look at this thing, was really early on when you got to see the Great Northern Wall in, in Ascalon. It just looked incredible. It was so big and so amazing. And I got that exact same feeling in Guild Wars 2 from this wall that the Tengu had built. It's so, so incredible. And there's even a, a giant gate and a massive bridge you can go on and there's a skill challenge there and you can speak to all these different Tengu about other Tengu from Guild Wars 1 and what they're doing there. It, it's fantastic. It's really, really cool. And I love what's going on with it. And I can't wait until that eventual expansion comes out, hopefully, and we'll be able to go through that gate and actually get in there. So anyway, yeah, that was on my list. Um, I'll go back to the one I skipped tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, moving on, we've got a few questions today. They all came from the comment section from yesterday's video. By the way, did see the massive discussion between, it looks like pretty much just two of you were having a big old chat. Uh, very entertaining, guys. Don't forget that though, it is just a game, so there's no need for too much name calling. But you pretty much dominated most of the comment section yesterday, so thanks very much for that. Um, also, I thought it was really cool, actually, to see a lot of you still talking about Cadian and the Nightmare Court and stuff. Uh, I don't actually like to bang on about the Silvari too much. I actually think they get too much attention in comparison to the other races that have got a lot of cool lore for themselves as well. But uh, some people did confirm actually they, they quoted a couple of interviews and stuff where the devs seem to talk as if Cadian is still alive, like he hasn't died. So Cadian founded the Nightmare Core and the idea is he, essentially one of his main motivations for that was because he knew that that would get him the attention from the Pale Tree and he really wanted this attention. He kind of came out and he thought he was special, he was the first of the second generation and he really wanted that attention but he never got it. And so it's quite a tragic character really. Then he founded the Nightmare Core so that he could get this attention, but now Foulane is actually in charge of it, and once again he finds himself number two. And it seems that he probably is still alive out there somewhere. He's a really in-depth character. I love tragic characters, I really do, particularly in the Guild Wars universe. They're my favourite ones. And this guy seems really interesting. He's got a fair bit of depth to him. I don't actually necessarily think he is evil, as the original commenter said uh, a couple of days ago. I don't think he's evil at all. Um, he's just been sort of swayed in a certain way, and I think a lot of us really can relate to that. I think a lot of us on some level want to have something special about us and you can kind of 
feel a bit sorry for Cadian in that regard. So yeah, that's really cool, and I loved you guys talking about that and giving me the little bit of extra information, so thanks for that. Obviously, there is still the question of when we actually get in-game. Yes, the Nightmare Court is this cool story, and it's quite a compelling and interesting story, but is the truth going to be when we're in-game, we're just going to see the Nightmare Court as red dots, basically. Well, they won't be red dots for Guild Wars 2, but we'll just see them as enemies to fight, and I, I am pretty sure that it probably will devolve into that, which is a shame, but hey, maybe ArenaNet will pull something out of the bag, and uh, we really will feel some sense of morality or question ourselves while we're fighting the Nightmare Court. That could be quite interesting, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. But yeah, it's uh, certainly very cool to think about nonetheless. Right, yeah, so I've got a few questions for today and I need to keep it quiet. I'll have to boost the audio probably. The first one, um, hey, Wooden Potatoes, here's a quick one for daily capes. Uh, that's from Secticide. Is that a quick question? Really? Is it now? I don't think it is, really. Um, so capes, Guild Wars 1, a big part of Guild Wars 1 was that when you joined a guild, you would get a cape, and the cape would have the emblem of the guild on it, and that was really cool. I remember some of my early, again, going back to early experiences in Guild Wars 1, um, most people in those very early days obviously hadn't got guilds at that moment, and I, I used to get so jealous of people that had capes. I'd be like, oh my god, you've got a cape? What's going on there? And it used to cost a fair amount of money in those early days as well to get your guild up and running as particularly the guild hall and stuff and um, so that was a big part of guild wars one obviously later on in the game's lifespan just every man and his dog had a cape and there was even the option to turn your cape off and still be in a guild if you want for people that didn't like it in particular in guild wars one capes had a lot of clipping issues and that was really irksome certain armors that you'd be wearing it would just look awful um but the capes were always quite cool and in fact i was always quite impressed with the physics and stuff and the way they blew around it, despite the clipping uh, in guild wars one and it would say be very cool to see them in Guild Wars 2 as well. Um, a long time ago they were asked, are there going to be capes in the game? This was a very long time ago. And they seemed to say no, basically. Instead, they were going to go for tabards, and this was kind of the idea that we, we constructed from what they'd said. It seemed like there weren't going to be capes, but there was a lot of concept art and a lot of hints and things that maybe there was going to be some kind of tabard system in there. So that instead of having an emblem on a cape for your character, now the emblem would actually appear on the armour, which would be, actually, if you think about it, a very complicated and weird thing to do. Uh, very, very difficult. And it actually seems like that isn't the case, because now, if you look, if anybody saw, when you're in-game, you've obviously you've got your armor and your weapons right that's the main equipment that you're probably familiar with but also in guild wars 2 you've probably seen it there's another section of things you can equip as well these are your accessories right and your accessories consist of uh two earring slots i believe uh two ring slots uh, another slot for something that there's six of them in total and one of them however is a back slot so for your main army you've got like a shoulder slot and you've got a cure slot but actually on your accessories you've got a back slot now over on the wiki the guys seem to have just written that as capes i'm not sure whether that comes from an interview i've certainly never heard of that of them confirming 100 percent the capes are going to be there but it certainly seems like because we have this back slot here now that there will be capes in game i don't believe that they've been seen at all on any players certainly in the beta so far and even on npcs in the world either i mean with certain things that they've just restricted to us in the beta so we can't see like for example dance emotes you can still see on npcs they're in the game in with certain events and certain things that happen. You can see the dances, and some of those videos are out there on YouTube, and you can see it. Now, you'd think that if capes were fully in the game and all that functionality and stuff was there and we would be able to have capes in Guild Wars 2, then you might see some NPCs with it, right? It's more flavour. It's more things that they can use to differentiate how all the NPCs look from one another. I mean, one of the main problems in one of the early evaders was some of the NPCs looked exactly identical. you just find them in totally different areas of the world. But I haven't seen anything for capes at all. Now, I fully hold up my hands. This is something that I may be missing an interview from and that they have 100% confirmed that we're going to have capes that is what that back slot's for it certainly seems like it but it's over my head right now and I don't think we've seen them in the beta it's uh, it's something I hope to see as I say for Guild Wars 1 capes were a big thing and I think it would be a bit of a shame if in Guild Wars 2 we didn't have them back uh, but there is still room for them to potentially not be there I suppose this whole idea of having your guild's emblem on some part of your body is still there in Guild Wars 2 so if you guys aren't that familiar with guilds there there are like four different trees. As, you, as you're in a guild in Guild Wars 2, I should explain, there is a currency called influence, right? So while you complete events and do stuff in the game world, you actually gain influence for your guild, which is just this number that goes up and up. Think of influence as a type of money that only your guild can spend. Now, you can spend that influence in four different trees, and in one of those trees, you can actually find the option to purchase the ability to buy equipment that has your guild's emblem on it. So that could be weapons or armor. I guess it just says equipment at the moment. So you can actually do that through your guilds already. So what the capes were originally f serving 
as a function is there in Guild Wars 2. Does that mean that capes would be useless in Guild Wars 2? Well, I'd hope not, but uh, it's certainly not something we've seen so far. Maybe it is on their plans, maybe it won't be there at launch, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to see that that back slot can be used for capes. I haven't seen anything else it can be used for. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's about my extent of knowledge on the topic. If anybody does say that there's been a bit more information, if you do tell me, I will expand on what I've said in tomorrow's daily, but that, that's what I think we all know for now. Uh, the next question is from Persuasive Murder, who said, Do you think the areas will have event-like weather, such as November, February, some areas having snow, or just having a colder art style, or June, making some areas look hotter, etc.? I, I guess you mean seasons here, um, instead of weather. Yeah, that would be really cool. I remember, like, Ion. Didn't Ion do something like this? And there were actual time-lapse videos of certain areas beginning to snow and stuff. That's a really cool idea. It doesn't look like Guild Wars 2 is doing this at all, not in any major way. We're not going to expect to see in winter stuff get snowy however they're probably i wouldn't be surprised to see that come uh, seasonal events so like when halloween happens or when christmas happens or winter's day as they call it interior the certain areas will be decorated to look like they're snowing that was something that happened in guild wars 1 and i think arena net would definitely go for the same kind of thing in guild wars 2 how large of an area i'm not sure it would be amazing definitely to see like all of Kryter be frosted over when winter comes but that's probably not going to happen it would be a hell of a lot of effort to to be able to do something like that because they probably have to swap out all the textures unless they develop some kind of system where they can uh, apply like shaders over everything and those kinds of things always get really complicated so it's not something they've talked about they do very much stand by there we're not going to do it unless we can do it well so don't expect it but you might find it to a minor degree with the seasonal events as i say like winter's day and like halloween and whatever new ones they're going to be adding for guild wars 2 the last question for today is from AK is better than you who says hey potatoes I was wondering is it just me or is the experience that you get from the heart events or whatever they're called isn't enough to level up while I was playing I found myself constantly doing quests that required a higher level and still not be able to level up enough for the next area yeah I was finding this as well I'm not sure either what my opinion really is on it at the moment because I guess the idea is well the, the, maybe arena net are going for one of two things the first idea is that they are expecting you to go to not just one starting area which is curious to me they have said something along these lines in like one of the reddit AMAs and I, I wonder whether they should really be encouraging us to do this and by, by this I mean you can complete all of the Queensdale hearts find all the points of interest do all of that checklist crap that everybody's you know tempted to do and then find that you're not high enough level to move any real distance into Kessex Hills and at that point they're essentially encouraging you and saying right now go do say the Caledon Forest go do Metrica Province do one of these do more than one of your races area and then you'll be able to progress and are they specifically encouraging and expecting us to do that that doesn't make much sense to me considering that the personal story doesn't ever guide you to those places and that's something else also to factor in here I think for the beta a lot of us haven't been doing personal story stuff I don't mean to speak for everyone but I think that's been the general vibe I've got quite a few people have been holding off and if indeed you have been holding off with the personal story you will find that that gives you a fair bit of experience for continuing along so maybe there's an expectation there as well that you're supposed to finish all this checklist stuff in in one of the areas and do personal story stuff until your appropriate level and then you will be leveled enough to continue maybe they're only expecting you to be able to progress at a decent pace if you're doing both types of content together which again is curious i don't know whether i agree with that is it good that they're forcing us to do both of these things i think maybe yes i think uh Sometimes we can just keep grinding on with something, keep, you know, finding all the points of interest, then go to the next area, and then the next, and the next, and then you don't quite realise that the game has kind of become a bit monotonous and there's not been much breaking it up I think the personal story encouraging people to go and do the personal story might be good in that regard and by the same token maybe it is a good idea if they encourage us to go to the other starting areas obviously there's the question then what about once we're past Lion's Arch and that level 30 stuff and there's far less choice for level appropriate areas you know you might only have two level 50 to 60 zones that you can pick from and what about there are we still going to have these problems or are we going to be getting more experience comparatively so we can progress it's interesting to me and the other idea is also maybe they don't want people to just go through on a checklist maybe you are deliberately not getting enough experience to be at a high enough level to continue on just from doing all the points and interests and heart quests and vistas and all that maybe they're deliberately doing that because they're saying to you take your time explore the world go and find the cool little things we've hidden here spend some time doing events instead of just finishing the hearts and then pissing off elsewhere 
take your time with it and then you'll get loads more experience. Maybe that's what they're saying. Again, I can imagine people complaining about that though, saying, oh, well, I don't want them to force me to go at their pace. I want to go at my own pace. Well, that to me also is a bit of a flawed argument. You can't say, oh, I want to always go at my own pace. You're always going to be going at the developer's pace. If you could go at your own pace, that's pretty much asking the developers to give you a hit level 80 now button for all of PVE. It just doesn't work that way. But well, why they are doing it this way, I'm not sure. I think it's probably just the personal story thing. I think they're expecting us to do them in tandem, which again, I don't have a problem with. And then there's also crafting as well. Think of that. If you were to max every single crafting tree, then that's going to give you enough experience to go to level 80 as well. So if you're missing out on that whole chunk of the game, then you're also going to be under leveled. So it's curious. The main thing I would say, I like that they're going to encourage us to do these other things that are available in the game so that we'll level up a little bit more. So we're not going to just get massive levels constantly from just doing one thing. And there is that encouragement to go as well. But the one thing I would say is that there needs to be more direction for players. There needs to be, when you are now at this point where you are under leveled for the content you're about to go to, there needs to be some way of letting players know, hey, if you went off and did some crafting with all those materials you'd got, then you'll actually get a load more experience. So don't forget about crafting. Don't forget about the personal story. Don't forget about the mini games. Don't forget about this, this or this. You'll get that extra experience to take you further forward. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my opinion on it. Um, I definitely did find the same thing though. I was just being very narrow and focusing on one thing and then realizing, oh God, I thought I was doing everything. I thought, hey, look, I've 100 percented everything. I've been thorough. But the truth is I hadn't because I'd only been on a very small section of the game. And now all of a sudden I was like under leveled, even though I felt like I was done. Maybe the truth is we're not done. We just need to branch out into other types of things. Uh, but I'll, I'm curious to see what you guys think of that whole idea. I mean, I'm sure some of us are expecting to just be able to go in and coast through everything for a game that claims to have like no grind at all. I, I suppose to some people that does mean that they'll never hit this point where they are under leveled. Is, it, is that what that means to you guys? Would you be disappointed? How many of you found that exact same thing happen to you? I'm curious. Anyway, there you go guys. That was the great Guild Wars 2 countdown quiet edition. I will see you next time for another episode, another jumping puzzle, and blah 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 blah. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good evening.